on the league finals day today, so we'll be reflecting on that. And we've got a championship um, treble winner with us today, Cliff, which is um, always good. That's a real big beaming smile, Danny. So, yeah. <laughs> Sounds all right, that. Yeah, I like that introduction. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> like that. But um, yeah, it's, uh, um, we haven't had you on too often, Danny, but um, uh, obviously the right time to have you on now. So, uh, uh, Cliff, it's always uh, great to have somebody who's had a fantastic season as what basically Stoke Town have had. Yeah, and, you know, we've spoken to Basingstoke in the last few years, a few times, the previous chairman to the, to the manager a couple of times. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying they weren't great times before, but what a great season they've had this season. So it's great to start off uh, the Wessex Football League show today uh, with our first guest, which is uh, Daniel Brownlee, the manager of local treble winners, Basingstoke Town. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Pleasure had to be on. Uh, so you've when you've been away with the players this week to celebrate. You've been having fun together. Yeah, we uh, we celebrated. Uh, we we played at Fratton Park in our last game, and then the boys were off to Benidorm. I mean, some were off about seven hours later. Um, <laughs> it was an interesting experience. It was an interesting experience. Uh, but no, they deserved it. What a, what a season! It's just been incredible. So uh, yeah, they they deserve their uh, ability to go and celebrate it. Uh, where do we start? Obviously, the priority was promotion for you. You've achieved that as the the champions of the South Central Division of the Isthmian League, which is wonderful stuff. And then you've also icing on the cake, won two cup finals as well. So a treble. Yeah, it's it's just been the most remarkable season. Um, I had a call with with Terry Brown, who I'm I'm sure you all know, um, incredibly decorated manager and someone. I almost feel embarrassed to call a friend because I, I hold him in such high regard that I, I feel like I, I should kind of serve and bow to him whenever he speaks <laughs> to me. But um, he, he called me up not, not long after uh, the, the the final. Um, and it was, <laughs> whilst he was very complimentary, it was also a bit of a, a hammer home that don't get used to it because it won't happen again. So <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to soak it up. And um, not that we've milked it because my God, the, the boys have, like I say, they've earned their stripes to celebrate, and uh, and absolutely they should. But it, it it's uh, just the most bonkers season, uh, particularly when you look at the the opening fixtures. I think we we I think it was four points in the first twelve available to us. Mm-hmm. Um, so we stuttered, like we really stuttered, and I, I think there were a few groans from the crowd. I remember losing to Westfield four nil, um, and there were a few murmurs of "here we go again" type, but. They never gave in, um, and and that was the beauty of it. And and in all three competitions, we we would we've just been magnificent. And uh, yeah, I'm very very proud of of the group and the club and the way we've we've gone about it. So to win the league, it came to the last day. It came yeah. to a home game at Winklebury, but the fate wasn't in your hands yet. You still ended up going up as champions. Yeah, that's right. So the the last set of the season. Um, we were nine points, sorry, nine goals behind Walton and Hersham. Remarkable, really. I think we 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 played the same amount of games, won the same amount, lost the same amount, and drawn the same amount. The only thing that separated us was that Walton had scored nine goals. Um, so they were playing Thatcham away. We were playing South Park at home. Um, and whilst we were we were confident we could do our job, and that this is no disrespect to Thatcham, and and there's there's other reasons um, like where they finished in the league, obviously Walton were, were clear favourites, but we needed to better Walton's result. And uh, I mean, the way it panned out, I mean, it was just remarkable. If you were to write a script, you'd probably sack the producer for being too far fetched. It was just, <laughs> just incredible. Um, I will never, ever in my life forget that moment. Um, and it was just, it was just the 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 peaks and the trough of the game. So, so we've gone into the game, and I've said to the boys, look, we've got a 15% chance of winning the league. Like We had a meeting on the Thursday with all the management staff. I said, we've got about 15%. So we can either do one or two things. We can either go hell for leather on the Saturday and hope that Thatcher would do us a favour, um, or we kind of protect lads 
that were going to play involved in the playoffs, which was only going to be three or four days later. So it kind of became a bit of a disadvantage being involved in the game because you go, well, all the other teams, the likes of Marlow and Northwood and Hamworth Villa can go, right, we're going to play the kids today and just prepare for Wednesday. So, but the the, the fact that there was a chance and the fact that it was Thatcham uh, made me go, we've just, we've just got to go for it. And, and, the, the reason why I say it, Thatcham, like if, if I was to send Walton and Hersham to, to any club on the last set of season in the way that it happened, Chipstead would have been one because I, th- I just think it's a horrible place to go and play football and it's really difficult to play and Thatcham would have been the other. And the, the, the romance of it is uh, the, the the manager at Thatcham is a very good mate of mine. So <laughs> I was on FaceTime to him moments after the game, showing him the 1,600 people uh, on the pitch, just going, look what you've done. Like, <laughs> Look what you've done. Just incredible. Um, but even even during the game, so we we kicked off slightly later than them in the second half. And we had a false start for whatever reason. I think one of our players ran over the line, so the referees called it back. But in that moment, it just erupted behind the goal. So we'd learned that Thatcher had gone one up at that point. And then a kind of news travels that oh, they've equalized and they've gone two one. Um, and at that point. Aaron, God bless him, Nicholson, my assistant manager, he'd been suspended for the game. So he's up in the skies uh, overlooking the game and we're just on uh, a phone call. So he's in my ear. He says, Gaff, we've gone, we've gone 2-1 down. Uh, they're, they're 2-1. I was like, all right, we might as well just end this conversation. So we hung up. That was it. Like We, don't, we didn't speak to each other again. Um, because at 2-1, Walton don't lose games. You know, that they've they've shown all the way through the season that they're capable of just just seeing out games and, and incredible they're an incredibly gifted team. And then Thatcham in typical Yash style just wouldn't say die. And it was it was in the final minute of that game where uh, Ashley Howells has plucked one top corner. Incredible goal as well. Really both brilliant goals. Cameron Rohart Brown scores an incredible free kick. I don't think he scored one better in his life. And uh, Ashley Howells takes one a couple of touches in the box and Perks at top left, but oh my God, what a moment. What a moment. Never heard a noise like it. And don't think I ever will again. What was it like to have all those fans for the, the game as well, Danny? Do you know what? I mean, it, it was, we've been building and building and building the crowds. Um, and it's it's testament to what Basingstoke represents in terms of sport and whether you want me to to open that can of worms because it's a, <laughs> it's a mightily big one, but happy yeah, to talk yeah. about it. The, the, the council haven't necessarily been the most in, in, inclusive and supportive of uh, sport in the borough over the course of the last, I mean, however long. Um, but to get to get sixteen hundred people down on a day where, in reality, it was just our final game of the season yeah. because we didn't give ourselves much hope. There were a few people that that did. Uh, one of my coaches, Paul Wersfold, who who I love. Um, incredible mind and and just beautiful person, and he was like, "We'll do it today." And it was just, it wasn't a kind of um, a way to G me up. He was just like, yeah, it'll happen. And he's ex Thatcham. He's the old, old Thatcham captain. So he knows how difficult it is to, to go down there. He's like, yeah, we'll do it. And the other one is a guy called Jack Collins. Um, and Jack is uh, our assistant kit man, um, has learning difficulties. And uh, he's, I think he suffers from autism. But he was so adamant all week that we'll win the league. And he was right. He was right, and that that sixteen hundred. Um, I just, I've, I've been to some games, and people think I'm exaggerating. But if you were to, if you were to go per square meter of noise in that moment, I've never, I've never seen anything like it. Never seen anything like it. Um, to win it in that style, um, obviously, it's it's you're never going to rival the Aguero moment. You're never going to rival the. I'm a United fan, so the, the 99 goals with Solskjaer and Sheringham. But, I mean, it's the closest we can bloody get to it at, at non-league level. Um, and the beauty was at that time, we were 3-1 up. So the remaining three minutes of our game, because we had slightly longer to play, it was just a carnival. It was just a carnival of anticipation for that the, the referee to blow the whistle. And when he did, I've got... 85-year-olds, 90-year-olds coming onto the pitch saying thank you because they never th- th- thought they'd see it in their lifetime again. You've got stewards that have been with us through thick and thin over in Winchester crying, hugging other people. You've got board members on their knees looking at the skies. It just, it was a really sobering moment. Not only was it a huge celebration, but it was it was such a sobering moment to realise, or uh, I've always realised it, but, but a visual representation of what this football club, and more generally what football means, to really 
good people yeah. uh, and it was just it will live with me for a lifetime that it really will just um a magical moment how many you know how did it come from the first person in the ground realizing that the other result was in your favor to the rest of the crowd knowing and so something like these are spontaneous moments aren't yeah they? it was so um again you, you just think the romance of it uh so I mean, this is this is very selfish to me. Obviously, everyone else has got a different experience of how it happened. But at that point, I'd, I'd just been getting Sam Argent ready because we wanted to put him on because I wanted to take Brad Wilson off because I thought if he gets another book in, then he's going to miss the, fight, the the playoffs. And I said, I can't, I can't be affording that. So we're ready in Sam Argent. I've turned around to Argent and gone, right, get yourself sorted, you're going on. And I've looked up and my wife is opposite in the main stand with our newborn and, and Mia, my daughter, has only been to like two games. I mean, she's five months old. She doesn't know, have a clue what's going on. Um, and then the, the the stadium is full. There's not a seat in the house um, other than one seat. And this is this is where, if like very selfishly for me, it kind of was, was more meaningful. The only seat in the house that was empty was the place where my dad used to sit. My dad died two years ago. Um, and in that moment, I've looked at my wife, I've looked down at the seat and gone, that's weird. Like, that's that's nice. Like, I was thinking, that's nice. I've looked back up to Stacey, the wife, and um, Jack Miller, the chairman, is just behind her. And I've seen Jack gone with his head, to, head in his hands and, and kind of looked at it. And then he's put his hands in the air. And then I've just seen him skip from left to right across, just bellowing. I, I've gone through what he was saying, just this cheering. I've gone... No, I said it, and, and I just went cold. Like it's the only way I can describe it. From from head to toe, just went this feeling of ice cold. Going, it can't be that. It surely can't be that. And then it just started trickling through, and you could see everyone get out their fans, and it, it was like a Mexican wave of noise, <laughs> and people just trusted it. And it was just this. I mean, still to this day, I've never scored a goal. Like we've never scored a goal that has created that reaction mm. and it was just parents and kids and arms and legs and everything in the air and it, it just it was just remarkable just remarkable and then it happened again two minutes later because the game had ended because even at that point I'm not mm. naive enough to believe that Walton can't go and pinch another one um and the 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 completely contrasting um, emotion was maybe four years ago where we actually got relegated as a club and I was assistant manager to Martin Cole at the time. Um, and we needed five results to, we were, I think, sixth from bottom or, or seventh from bottom or something like that. If, if one of the teams below us and there were five that could get relegated on that day, drop points in any way, then we'd have been fine. Of, of course, what happened every five teams won and we drew, I think it was with Taunton. So we got relegated that day, but on that day, there was, there was a bit of a delay with um, the, the news coming through because teams finished a little bit late because of injury time, whatever. And there was a moment where it erupted because they thought, Oh, someone's equalized. And so we're not relegated. And then we found out we were relegated and then, Oh my God, there's another late. And it, it just, you had this peak and trough moment. So we'd experienced that before. And there was a moment where I, I said to John Boardman, uh, I got another coach, said, will you check? Will you check? Before, before I react, will you check? And he had a mate at the, at the Thatcham game and he just looked at me and went, it's done. And it just, ah, oh, just magical. Like really was. I could retire happy now. <laughs> Genuinely. Like if, if, if that's the only moment that football can produce for me, then I'll, I'm, I'm a happy man. Because that was... Um, on a very selfish level, like really meaningful and purposeful for me, because I've, I've always suffered from self-doubt and uh, imposter syndrome when it's come through management. And I've been very lucky to be in charge of some some fabulous sides, and um, I've I've actually won I've won far more than I've lost in 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 a very short career, which is amazing. But I've, I still suffer from this kind of imposter syndrome. So it was a it was a incredible selfish moment, but then to see the wider impact just incredible really is like good people good good honest people at Basingstoke that um just want to see their football team do well and do it properly and we delivered it the boys delivered it and it was just yeah I've got, I've got it's great to see you know if, if you're not watching on Facebook live Dan's got a great big smile on his face <laughs> as he's telling us <laughs> a, 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 a similar story that I can tell you as a reporter is uh 
Gosport had to win and hope to get into the step four playoffs. Um, and they did win, but the other score, uh, I think it was had to come in from Froome and they were putting nothing on social media. So the game had finished at Gosport and nobody knew what was happening at Froome. So I had like a, a Southern League handbook in my reporter's bag. So I just looked up the secretary, phoned him up, asked him the final score, then said to him, are you absolutely sure? Because this means Gosport have made the playoffs. And he said, yes. And then I've walked from the corner flag where the radio car was to the, towards the centre circle along the perimeter. And it's in, I'm the only person in the stadium that knows that Gosport have made the playoffs. <laughs> and it's in my head because Alex Pike, their manager then, was such a showman. It was in my head to walk on the pitch, walk up to him, offer him a handshake and lift his hand above his head in the most dramatic <laughs> but it never happened because as I was walking along the perimeter uh, one of the fans just asked me what was the score in the other game and I told the fan and then uh, it, no. it got up the line by word of mouth faster than I could walk so by the time <laughs> by the time I got to the pitch gospel were already jumping uh, around but on that day uh, Froome had to do gospel a favour and they played the game without a recognised goalkeeper, yet they still got a draw. And Gosport went up in the playoffs that day. So I, I almost had a similar moment that, you know, but I was beaten to it. I, I re released my exclusive to someone else. Yeah. And but that's what you live for, right? Right, within yeah. football. <laughs> and it is, like every, everyone sets up at the start of the season and there'll be managers now having conversations with players about what they want to achieve. And we all say the same stuff, you know? We, we, we want to win every game of football and we want to get promoted. Like, that's that's the be-all and end-all football. There, there will be a couple of teams that will understand their role in the league because of budgets and ground grade and all that stuff that, that don't have that luxury of, of wanting the, the progression or the ambition in that moment but it's all what we all set out for so when you when you're on the receiving end of those moments you just live for it and it's a bit of a punishment because again like like terry said to replicate that now to gain that feeling again is not not an impossible, but to to win a treble in the manner that we did, like last minute winner against Bournemouth at Fratton Park, ten hours before they were going to Benidorm, like it was just the most perfect script for a, a really special group of of men. Um, but it is it's it's absolutely what you, what you live for. Um, and it, and again, I, I I can't I can't stress enough. It's the, the sober moment was seeing the impact of of other people and it would be the same at Gosport you know it's it's not just that changing room it's not just that that management staff it's it is that fan who's been to Truro away on a Tuesday and I up up to Cinderford and yeah. back down to Tiverton and up to like all these different places and it's for them you know it's for them it's actually probably more for them really because it impacts them than more than anyone um well, so I'd love to be with his, with his, with Bath and Stoke as, as for as long as possible because I've, I've fallen in love with the place. At some stage, I will move on. There's, there's an inevitability about it, but the fans won't go. Um, so it's way more for them than it than it ever will be for for us. We can bank memories, but they live it. They live and breathe it until the the day that they no longer go. Um, so it's yeah, it's it's massively important that. But the the feeling, the the, the opportunity to offer that feeling is just something I will now spend my living days in football management trying to to reachieve and it's it's not easy you know it's not easy um well, you've, you've set the bar really high you have and yeah what, what yeah. Also i think is that what makes it what i assume makes it sweeter for your fans looking in from the outside is you just have to go back a couple of years there's the uncertainty where are you going to play what league yeah. are you going to be in and then even when you've got it sorted on the pitch last year uh, you got to the playoffs, but didn't pro, uh, progress. So it must be extremely sweet to achieve your goal this year. Yeah, massively. And look, last last year um, was a, was a big learning curve, and we we I think we always knew, or certainly in management, we we kind of knew that we weren't we weren't particularly well equipped to go into those playoffs um, to to win it. We had a chance. Everyone does, and playoffs have a, an odd way of um, of kind of uh, throwing up odd results. I mean, there, there was some stat, I think in the last 10 years, I think there's only one team that have won it from second place. Um, obviously, Walton did it. Um, thankfully, Walton did it because they, they more than deserve to go up. Um, but it does, it has that habit of, of kind of throwing up odd results. 
but to be yet yeah, to, to to do it in that in that kind of style with what the club has been through and what the fans obviously conversely have, have been through is is um incredibly sweet to use your phraseology like it it, it was a a moment to savor and I, I think that the only thing if i was to to re-narrate it um and i, I there's, no, there's not much i want to change about it but i think the the only bit where the boys have have been uh stung a little bit if you like and it's it's a i'm clutching here because it's very minimal but there, there was a narrative of the that walton lost the league or thatch and won us the league and it's this idea that 10 seconds of play identifies the whole season and you forget we've won 37 other games to get to to get to that point and it's not it's not hinged on a singular moment and i i, th- I think that there was there was a point um i was i i i'll be honest i was a bit bitter with um Walton's reaction straight after the game because they put a tweet up saying Walton have thrown it away or Walton have lost the title. Some words to that effect. Like, no one has ever lost a title. You don't lose a title. You win a title. You can't lose a title. Um, so I was a bit disappointed with with the way that that was narrated. But I mean, I, I mean that's me clutching. You know, <laughs> if, I, if I was to find something to moan at, that would be it. But it's it's that's football. You know, like it's um, you look at the way Arsenal will now be treated as as bottle jobs and stuff like that. They're not just Man City are incredible. Um it's the same with Walton. Like they 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 didn't lose the league that that day. They we we just we bettered them over the season. Like that that's the truth of it. Like as for as great as Walton are and they play some fantastic football, um we were more consistent because we finished two points ahead of them. And that's the reality of it. So we we're, we're we're incredibly proud of that because they're they're a formidable team with with great management. Um but yeah, we've to answer your question because I know I went around the houses then. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's a really sweet feeling, and 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 particularly where the club has been, and and the biggest task now is managing expectation, um, because there will be fans there that go right. We'll just do it all again, shall we? Should we go and win the treble next year? Yeah. <laughs> well, you just calm down a little bit. Yeah, exactly. You got you got that reality it, as you move up through the pyramid down, haven't you? You know you can't. That's- you can't you can't go and steamroller everything season after season because that's just uh, an impracticality. You know? Yeah, and um, uh, it goes back to what you said about the narratives just now. You know um, that that moment in time when your your wins announced, all the people that want to run you down will put something on social media, um, and you're right. You know Arsenal are, are, are being berated, but you know West West um, Man City have been absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. You know, and um, I would imagine all of your supporters would sit down and say you've been phenomenal this season. Yeah, I, I, I think we have, and, and the, the nice thing about it is that I've, I've always felt somewhat of a responsibility, particularly because we've got a sizable fan base, con- considering the, the level that we're at. Like I, I think we're one of the, the, the kind of most supported teams, really. At, at maybe even step four. Um, you've got Chertsey that are very well supported at, in, in our league. Um, Hamworth Villa have, sorry, Ham. Um, Walton and Hersham have have created almost a, a new fan base through real modern terms, which again is 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 great. Um, and then you've got Leatherhead probably is is the closest to us, and Guernsey because it's so centric. But um, I, I always feel a responsibility to put on good football. Um, we have the luxury of 4G, so we d- we don't have to be um, overly pragmatic. I think is the, the term that people would use. We can play football and, and try and play good attacking football. And I, I never to the sacrifice of results. Like I'm not naive enough to believe that we can go and play this beautiful brand of free flowing football and, and expect to win leagues. Like you, sometimes we have to. Um, my phrase is always strap a tin hat and dig a trench, and sometimes you have to do that. But um, there is a responsibility that we want to play good football. And, and the nice thing about this year is not only have we won it, the 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 people that have come to watch us week in, week out have enjoyed the way we've played, which is almost as big a compliment as winning the league. Because if they can keep coming back, then the club grows. And if the club grows, we can on the pitch grow. And, and then suddenly we start adding on. Because mm-hmm. um, God knows we need to, because we took a, a huge, huge step back with the loss of the Camrose and... Um, again, that that can of worms is sat there ready yeah. to be cracked open. But it, it it was it was a massive dent in the club's history, and still is. It still is. I mean, the only the only glimmer of hope now is that the 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 council has actually been overturned. So there isn't there is a new leader um, as of two days ago that has on on the face of it or or by appearance a much more greater interest in sport, but we've still got to see it. 
you know it's very it's fine saying you're going to do something it's another thing doing it so we, we really hope that they they back up what they've previously been saying because the club deserve it the borough deserves it and the town deserves it um regardless of this season we could have finished in a relegation fight they still deserve a football club that has its own ground like and, it's, it's, yeah nonsense i mean what must be uh, must be tug at the heartstrings is that when you know the team were the supporters were on the bus to go to Fratton Park and you have to the coach went straight past the cameras and it yeah. it's oh. still there it's still there standing up mm. almost taunting you or yeah. almost you know it must be hard for everyone in the town to see it every day and yeah. it's, it's you know a bit of a ghost ship at the moment it's just you know what it's it's ridiculous it's it's just ridiculous and I, I'm um I feel like I want to say I'm bored of talking about it, but I never will be because it's such a, it's such an emotional topic for so many people. And, and, and the big thing of that, the the one thing that, that winds me up, like I'm quite laid back, um, even in management, I I find it very difficult to go straight to anger. I try and find reason before I find doubt or um, if, if, if a player's done something wrong, I sometimes look, okay, have I explained it properly? But the thing with this is the, the bit that annoys me most about anything is, is, is something being unjust. And that is, is just the, um, the foundation of everything that is unjust. A, 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 a man, Lord Camrose, who gifts a ground to the community. And then one man thinks it's his right to go, actually, the, this t- these two pieces of paper I now own, so therefore I can get rid of that. Like morally, it stinks. Legally, it stinks. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's just remarkable when you when you look at the timeline of everything, how it is allowed to happen. Um, and thank God this uh, this this new legislation, although late, is coming in via the government. I mean, I've I've not seen any real uh, change in it other than than a couple of words that are no, now noted down, but something needs to be done to protect football clubs. Like, look at Met Police now, like yeah. voluntary relegation. Like, what is that about? Like, it's just, it's mental that a club of that size and stature that was that was in the playoffs, what, two years ago, mm-hmm. now have to take voluntary relegation. And I, I'm, I've not done too much reading on it, so forgive me if it's, if it's anything other than finance, but I'm assuming it comes down to finance. And you, Harrow Borough, I think, were trying to appeal uh, that they wanted to go down. You just go, God, is that what football is now? Like it used to be, how plucky can we be and how ambitious can we be? And now it's, can we survive? And for football that is so important to so many people, um, for a whole different breadth of things, like watching football is one thing, but the escapism that it that it creates, the the foundation of support in, in terms of friendship and networking, and uh, it, it provides so much um and and yet we we stand to lose it you know we stand to lose it so yeah the, the driving past the cameras on on that day was um was just a, a, a really weird feeling um particularly when you look at the size of Basingstoke comparatively to the size of Portsmouth there's not much in it you know we're going to this ground which we're all really excited about and we're going why doesn't not we expecting Fratton Park mm. but something that could create like become that eventually yeah. um and at the moment we're just we're we're completely locked like we are locked and i don't i don't know what the future holds i i i hope with the new council that's come in um that they can be more ambitious than the last and at least give us a glimmer of hope rather than just ignoring us i mean it sums it up that we've got an mp maria miller who is is the 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 mp for basingstoke like that's her job um she follows us on twitter uh she just kindly decided to about six months ago um and you've got the the basingstoke council between the two of them not a single message email phone call tweet anything just to say congratulations on a good season not a single thing and it just it blows my mind that and it and it just typifies the way that sport has been treated in the borough over the course of the last I mean, in my time at Basingstoke, I've been here, what, six years now. Um, but it, it, it dates far beyond me. Um, so hopefully this new council can reawaken what is a fantastic area for sport. Um, it, it, it really is a, a, an incredible place for, for sport when it's bouncing. Uh, the, the rugby team are a, a, a really good side and, and have been back to a certain extent 
still more could be done. The ice rink because now there's no longer there. Mm. Just got rid of it. And they they claim that um oh it'll be it'll be back next year. Mm. I said the same thing about cameras. You know, Simon Bounds, who was the councillor's last tweet, was um, about Bays and Stoke. It was about three years ago, and it was a PR stunt because the grass had been picked up from the from the cameras. And he and his tweet read something along the lines of, "I'll be making sure that I keep going back to see that grass has been grown." Mm-hmm. That was it. It's, it looks great on a tweet. You go brilliant, and it, you read the message underneath it, and all the Bays and Stoke fans are going brilliant. That's fantastic. Love that. Well done. Have we seen it? Have we? Fill in your own blank, like it's yeah. yeah. Anyway, down from a high horse, football. <laughs> Dan, I've, I've, Dan, I've got a bit of heritage, of, obviously, with um, Bees and Stoke. Um, I was born just down the road from there, and all my close family uh, live in Bees and Stoke. And my mum was buried there, so I know exactly how you felt that night driving past um, the ground now, yeah. because obviously I have to do that to go up to the cemetery. And it is just sacrilege because yeah. you would have liked to have thought that when the cameras was closed initially, that the work would have started straight away. But you go back to the, the original legacy, which so many people don't know about. You know, it, it's it's just a unique story. And it's, in yeah. it's, you know, what what other football club could you possibly say um, developed through... Um, Lord Camrose's um, sort of legacy. Yeah, you know, I, I can't but, think of any. But the that's that was a great. I've got to use the see if I can pronounce the right word a philanthropic yeah. gesture, which is yeah. wonderful. But it's also very good, Greg, that work didn't happen straight away on, on Camrose. That it wasn't totally. there isn't something there now. So it yeah. just yeah. still yeah. gives still gives. Hope. I mean, that, that's not through lack of effort. So within within a week of the closure, we were genuinely finding pieces of the of the ground on eBay, mm-hmm. turnstiles being sold, ground uh, like uh, I, yeah. I can't remember what else was on there. You could bid for it, like yeah. it just just honestly, it, it it just stinks. The whole lot of it stinks. And you're right, like I I would love. Um, so you've got two people that are at the heart of it. You have got Rafi Razak, who is the the old chairman. Um, and again, you look at the timeline in hindsight because in in lifetime you go, yeah, look, he's spending spending a load of money on on wages and and great. There was never really any work on the club, but you got on with it if because it was just your football club. Or we didn't have any money, whatever. Um, and then Malcolm McPhail, who is just principally a property developer, or that's certainly how he 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 is labelled in my eyes. Um, no interest, just cold. Uh, he, he's he's I, I I was with him when he well sorry I wasn't with him. Kevin White, who was chairman at the time, um, quoted him as saying, "I could give you the money myself, but I don't, I don't want to." And it's just like you, it just it's the cold heartedness of it all. And it, I would love to create a scenario where even the family of Lord Camrose, because there's a few that exist in, like I think there's a couple in Northampton or whatever, mm-hmm. but just to sit them down and go, by the way, this is Lord Camrose's brother. Um, would you like to explain to him the reasons why you're not? like you're not carrying on with the 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 uh the ground mm. him to go ah oh, yeah I, uh because i lost money when i was chairman that's <laughs> my problem like and and that's the way he tries to deliver it that his his constant go to is that he saved the club he saved the club he put loads of money in and now he's just recouping what what he was owed via the sale of the cameras and and it's a really bad analogy but it's it's like picking up a stray dog off the street, taking them in, getting them better, feeding them, making sure that they're warm and fed and warped and, and looking better. And then just going, actually, do you know what? I don't care about you. I'll just kick you out anyway and just make it stray again. He hasn't helped. He's kicked a can down the road is what he's done. Um, but if he hadn't have done it, who knows what could have happened? Someone could have come in. The council could have come in. Well, who knows? But um yeah, it's just th- this this idea that he tries to paint himself a hero. And I, I think he's got to the stage now where if you tell a lie enough times, you'll be arrogant enough to believe it. And I think he's he's now gracing the land of that. I just I just think he's he's just blinded by his own arrogance and the yes people around him because it's it's such a sorry state. And and I'm sorry that you have to drive past it because it's I, I mean, my route to Bayes, yeah. it, 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 it doesn't. But 
everyone's affected because it's not, I know it's, I know it's very centric to our club in Basingstoke, but five, six years ago, we weren't thinking it was going to happen to us. Like no one was sat there going, oh, we've got to be careful because he could get rid of us. Because we're going, that can't happen, but it can. And and football clubs now, which is why my concern about people like Met Police is that, well, what next? Because if Met Police can't go up and suddenly it's lack of ambition, that ground is in a really good area for development. Mm-hmm. You know, And I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's you're not beyond the realms of it. And every football club at the moment is it's such a knife edge. It really is such a knife edge. And if you haven't got the the money and finance or supportership to get to get you through it, you're vulnerable. So that the, the camera's sitting there. And Newbury, Newbury's another one, Faraday Road. Uh, yeah. Same thing. Within what, 20 minutes of each other? Two football clubs that would have really impacted the culture and community of, of, of sport in the borough. Um, kids football, women's football, disabled sport. Like the, it, It's more than just 11 lads chasing a bit of leather around a park on a Saturday afternoon. Um, and, and it's lost, you know, it's lost and it's, and it, and it shouldn't be. And I, I, I'm, I'm it, it, it beggars belief that when you look at the wider impact of sport and even the money it can bring in, that councils and government aren't going, why can't we create more of these? <laughs> Not why are we getting rid of them? Um, they talk about antisocial behavior all the time. Give the give kids something to do, mm. give them something to do that they're proud of. Don't take away everything. Um, yeah, honestly, I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> yeah, it's, no, it's, it's an important it's, subject, and whatever, yeah. whatever, whatever the rights and wrongs, you know, we hope we'd love to see you back there if that's possible in the future. Um, You've been promoted, but you are no longer an Isthmian League club. You're going back into the Southern League. Was that a yeah. surprise? And is that something is that something you welcome? Oh, 100 uh, percent Now now Truro and Western have buggered off out. <laughs> it's great. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, journey-wise, it's brilliant. Um, yeah. like the the locations of all the teams is, I mean, it's almost as good as the league we're in we're in last year, to be honest. And I have to admit that the the, the Isthmian League has been it, it's probably been my favourite league that I've been in, not only for, for location, but it just felt organised. I have to admit from from um, when the weather was bad on a Friday night, getting an email in, in the morning saying, if you need to call it off Friday night, that's absolutely, your, you can do that. If both clubs agree, that's fine. And just little things like that just make yeah. the organisation of it so much easier. It saves yeah. people having to cancel buses on the day and losing 500 quid because of it it allows you to tell fans early doors like I, I genuinely believe that it was a really really good league um the southern the southern league geographically now is is really good um it looks really tough like it's an incredibly tough league uh you look at the teams have got promoted and and into that it's just that there's no gimmies there like if you if you i think you've got to have quality, but my God, you've got to have fitness because if you, if you, if you come undone with that, then you're going to be vulnerable. Cause I've, I've said it before. Like I'm not naive enough to believe that um, we're going to go and do the same thing that we did last year. We're going to try. Cause why wouldn't you? Um, but we could quite easily, or we could quite easily is the wrong term. We could be better than 19 teams in that league but we could also be worse than 19 teams in that league. I, I, I think the, the difference between top and bottom in that league next year is going to be really, really slim, really slim. Um, and God knows, like we're, I've never known a season to go so early. Well, we, we only finished kicking the ball last Wednesday and I'm seeing players being announced from teams and I can't, I can't keep up. I've, I've, I've honestly barely spoken to the wife, let alone players yet. Um, so it's... Uh, it's going to be an interesting, interesting league. Um, but I'm really excited about it. It's it's great. And the Do teams, you... obviously, the teams, um, obviously, um, with me, it's shown as well, um, Dan. Um, you're moving up that up that pyramid. You've re- even though you're successful as a team going up into that part of the pyramid, you've really got to be realistic enough to maybe look and say to yourself, well, first of all, we've got to sustain ourselves in the league, and secondly, we need to look to make sure that we've got the right calibre of player to be able to play at that level because the players that we've all got at, at step four um, were probably good enough um, to get us to where we wanted yeah. to go to. But 
realistically, just to survive, you're going to have to probably um, go into your budget yeah. to look at um, some really decent players. Yeah, I agree. That experience. Yeah, I agree. I think the more so than ever because the standard year on year seems to be increasing kind of no end like the 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 quality of football that's being played the quality of player that's coming through and i think a lot of that comes down to coaching at, at, at lower levels i think grassroots football is no longer the dad that's that's the least reluctant to to manage the team now does it i think there's aspiring coaches that are going in at under eight under nine even at sunday league level that go i want to be a coach so these kids are getting developed slightly better so the 17 18 19 year olds that are coming through now are of a really really good standard um and for that, I think that there is a there's an element of if you stand still, you're probably falling behind. So uh, we've probably labelled that we want three or four new players for next season to improve us. Kind of going back a year ago when we kind of started a, a bit of a, I think we brought in seven players last year that played a, a big part in in this year, and every conversation I had with them was I'm building a team for step three. So I, I, I've got a nucleus of a team, particularly in the experienced side of, of, of our, like you look at Michael Atkinson, Simon Dunn and Mark Scott and Paul Strudley, like yeah. names that have been synonymous with good sides over the course of the last kind of 10 years, really. Um, I've got a good nucleus there, but I'm not, not naive enough to, to believe that we can't or shouldn't improve because we're going to have to all the boys that did it last year deserve a crack and they'll all they'll all be back for pre-season um and and, and that's absolutely how it how it should be but there there will be contests there you know it's we, we've done it now we can we've got a celebration night on the third uh the third of june and once that is celebrated it's now right your trophies can go in a your downstairs loo for a couple of years you look back on it really favorably when you retired but unfortunately you can't take that trophy out on the first game of the season and go look lads we won this and expect to win a game like unfortunately it doesn't work like that so we know we've got our work cut out we know we're going to be um have to be somewhat plucky because i, th- I think we we're, we're going to be the underdogs going into a lot of games um not just coming from lower level, but you look at some of the, the historic sides in there, the, the likes of Salisbury and Co and Hungerford that have dropped down from a higher level. There's there's going to be some really, really tough games, but um, in we've, we've got to go for it. You know, what's the point in football if you're not going to be ambitious? Like I'm, I, I, I'm in, in eight years of management, I've been involved in one relegation fight and the rest have been chasing promotion. And I, I just can't stand this middle ground. I just... Mm-hmm. I, I, but it would bore the life out of me, honestly. I'd, ra- I'd rather be in a relegation fight than but in the middle, middle to bottom. I mean, if I am in a relegation fight, don't hold me to those words. But uh, no, I don't. I don't. Uh, we're we're going to go for it. That's the point. Say again. I said this is all recorded. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a meme by the end of the year. Um, but no, we're we're looking forward to it. You know, like it's um, it's a huge opportunity for the club to cement itself at a level that is worthy of the the club. Mm-hmm. Um, because step four for the size of Basin Stoke wasn't good enough. Like it, it's it's not. Um, step three is 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 about right for where we are at the moment and for for the capacity that we have. Um, and and I mean I know I know it I know it looks great on on um, on stats wise when you go okay Basin Stoke got seven hundred fifty eight hundred supporters coming down. On the face of it, it looks great, but no bar. We don't own our own ground, so yeah. automatically you're missing money and you're paying money out every game you have. Then you've got to pay the referees who are getting more and more expensive every year. Yeah, exactly. um, and it, and it, it's just the costs grow so much. Um, so once we've got the, the, the rest of the club in order, I think that will be the opportunity to go, OK, let's fly until that point it's it's kind of like let's just con- not consolidate because i don't like that word because it's almost like we'll, we'll do enough like we're, it's not it's not that mindset it's like we're just going to see how far we how far we can go um but we're not naive enough to think that we're going to go into that season and start like okay we're going to be top two that's that's the ambition the ambition is to win the first game of the season as boring as that is um that was the, the same methodology last year and it, it served us all right um, I've, I've always regarded football that it, it should be watched like individual TV programs, not as a film. Because if you watch it like a film, you'll only be disappointed. 20 other teams are going to be disappointed with the ending. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's only one good ending in a, in a league season. <laughs> um, so if you, if you watch it in kind of like, oh, that was a good TV show. I enjoyed that. I'll watch that again. That's great. We'll go again next week and we'll watch it. Um, so, yeah, I try, I try and divide the season up a little bit. Um, 
And the nature of non-league also is that come Christmas, the, the bottom three managers get sacked, three new managers come in, they then become playoff candidates because they've brought in a whole new team. And the, the team that you beat last week suddenly has got 16 new players in and it's... Mm-hmm. It's the nature of non-league, but I love it. It's great. Everyone's got the same opportunity, so it's great. Your your film this year, though, Danny, had uh, extra trailers, though, didn't it, with the two Oh, players. my God. <laughs> so, as luck would have it, um, we, like, we've done quite well content-wise in terms of the, the club and, and broadcasting media and allowing people to see a bit of an insight into, into the club. Um, on the last day of the season, we had two... Uh, Solent University students covering the game. We had a drone up in the sky, which is just, yeah. we just got the best footage ever. But <laughs> even better than that, we had a lad, uh, a, a lad called Dan Linton and another guy called Nathan, who about eight, nine weeks ago now said, we'd love to do a documentary and just follow you about. So mm-hmm. for the last six weeks, we've been followed, followed about. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've, they've listened to team talks. They've been at training. So we've, we've captured the season from... Yeah. Losing 5-1 at Walton when the season was over, as far as everyone's concerned, to winning the league, to winning the Hampshire Cup. And we've not watched it yet. So that oh, right. the yeah, premiere yeah. is on the 3rd of June uh, <laughs> when we have our celebration. So, I'm, I'm, yeah, that's going to be that's gonna be some sit in that. I mean, I don't know how they're going to scale that down to maybe half an hour because it's it'll have four hours worth of footage that I'd happily sit through. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been incredible in that sense. Your, your two cup competitions that you you won obviously North Hampshire Senior Cup you're probably expected to win you're the biggest team in that probably yeah. you give squad players a run out in that but you're expected to win that one Hampshire Senior Cup there's lots of teams higher in the pyramid than you yeah. um, but of course it leads to a showpiece final so how were yeah. those two finals for you really good really good um and and I mean, they feel a lot better now than they did during the season because during the season, it became somewhat of a distraction. Um, we had a bit of a, a dilemma the week before we played Walton because we were being asked to play the Aldershot game, uh, which was the semi-final of the, I want to say, Hampshire Senior Cup. Yeah, it was. Senior yeah. Cup. Yeah, it was. Um, on the Thursday. So we were, we were being told that we need to play on the Thursday, two days before Walton Hirsch, and we were like, that's not, not happening. So fair play to the chairman got every rule book out under the sun. I was like, got it. So we managed to, so we managed to play on the Tuesday. Um, but I mean, to be fair, the, the only, the only downside of that was the kids in the North Hans senior cup got us there. So there, there's a couple of lads, Prince de Cruz, Ethan Abraham, Noah Chengen. Um, there was a few others that, that played in a couple of the rounds that got us to that. And then you get to the Hampshire cup and you go, they should really be in the squad. They should, they should really be in the squad. Noah Chengen got in, Prince de Cruz didn't, and, and Ethan Abraham was with us, but but wasn't in the squad that day. Um, but it did, it became sort of a distraction. But once we got there, it was brilliant because it was the, the best, the best ending, the best showpiece ending. Yeah. But it can also work against you because we we had we got into the the North Hans Senior Cup final last year after the playoff final, after the playoff semi-final where we lost, sorry. And you go, okay, this should be a good day where we win this cup, we lift it up, we finish on a good end. We got beat 1-0 by Allsford. Um, or was it Whitchurch? It could have been Whitchurch, can't remember. Um, and it was just the biggest disappointment. I just There was no picking them up after it. You know how sometimes as a manager you want to go in and go, it's all right, lads, because this, this and this, and what a great season. I'm just going, yeah, that does, what can you do with that? But the Hampshire Cup final, the same. It would have been easier to narrate, look, lads, it's been a fantastic year. What a great day this was. Unfortunately, we didn't win it, but well done. Um, it would have been okay to have gone down that route, but the fact they won it, I didn't even go to the change rooms. I just left them to it. Just like, I, there's nothing I can say that is going to heighten what you're feeling right now. Um, so I just, just let them go in the change rooms and let them celebrate it. It was just a, a, rem- a brilliant day. And even that last minute winner. Yeah, that's that that must be the goal goal. Goal. yeah. Ah, just amazing. It, was, it amazing. was great watching. Um, fortunately, it was being streamed live by Hab Trophy as well. Yes. And, uh, uh, so you must have been on the pitch when I text you <laughs> congratulating you on oh, the uh, win. And we didn't come off. Uh, yeah, we had the Portsmouth guys going. We, you, you will need to go at some stage. You will need to go. Um, but yeah, just, yeah. just the best, just the best feeling. Um, and again, supporter wise, we, 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 the, the crowd was thirteen, just, just under fourteen hundred. I think it was. I think thirteen hundred and seventy-seven. I think was the final total. Um, 
1200 at a minimum was Basingstoke. And my God, when that goal went in, it was just, it, it, I said to Aaron, I said, I could do this every week because it was that, it was, it's the first time that I've managed in that kind of setting. And hearing that end where there was only 1300 people in the fratten end, as they call it, um, hearing that noise, I was like, oh, I could, oh, I could have this, this a bit of me, this, I could do this. Um, obviously, there's a long way to go before I even consider like the, 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 the realms of professional football. I've got a lot to learn before that, but, uh, yeah, just what a what a feeling! Like football is just remarkable in delivering those types of moments and the, and the the feeling you get from it. Obviously, the other side is is massively worse. Like the the feeling of losing in those kind of moments makes it really bad. But uh, yeah, I live for it. Absolutely live for those moments. Just great, and to do it with that group as well. Like I've not really spoke about the 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 lads, but just the the attitude of them the the companionship the thoughtfulness the kindness like it's a different change room to one that i've i certainly ever experienced as a player like if you if you showed a weakness it would be they'd find it and they'd pull it apart and and whack you around with it like it was a like a play doll whereas this lot they'll piece it together but they they just are and they still have a crap don't get me wrong we're not all, all in there singing kumbaya before a game <laughs> um, but it's they they have this amazing capacity to support each other in the best of ways and heighten each other and elevate and uh, I mean, Simon Dunn, the captain, and Michael Atkinson have been have been key components of that. But uh, the whole group, they've, they've just been just the most magnificent of men. Like the everything you'd want in a mate. And and I'm I, part of the reason for wanting to bring three or four in is that they are very close to becoming almost too pally, uh, where it kind of works against you. Um, and and. Sholin have, have managed that remarkably well um, yeah. because when you, I, I think they're probably when you look at the the teams in and around our level, I, I think you'd be hard pushed to find a team that has stayed together for so long. Than I mean, the Mason brothers have been alive for about forty years. Like I just, I, 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 I'm sixty-seven, uh, uh, Danny, and I think they're older than me now. But I was going to say, I just, you just can't get rid of them. Every time we play, show, oh god, the Mason brothers are still here, right? Okay, but Ross Allen in Guernsey, you just every every year you hope for his retirement and it never comes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, but that's a, that's remarkable in itself because it is it's a difficult thing to manage when they become so close because they they can sometimes be almost too forgiving or or go the other way and and it's but um yeah the the nature of the group is is has been just just the best I've ever worked with. And I've worked with some fantastic sides and talented sides, but in terms of everything you'd, you'd want to manage, um, I could have been pulling names out of a hat. I mean, Nathan Smart, interestingly, came up to me. Smart, he's 38 years old, although he's got the body of a 18-year-old GQ model. Like, it's just just ridiculous, that guy. Um, he came up to me because he, he he got stung. Um, we had Billy Billy Upton and Scott Armsworth who created a, a, a magnificent partnership. I think it was Billy or Scott get injured. Uh, Smarty came in for effectively 10 games and won pretty much all of them. And then there was a point where I had to make the decision of, do I rekindle that partnership of Scott and Bill? And I decided to, and 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 Smarty was a sacrificial lamb. And at 38 years old, he'd have every right to have of had a conversation with me. And I mean, the, the size of the blow, he could have floored me, but he accepted it. He was professional. He was disappointed, absolutely. But after the, the final whistle on the, the the last game of the season, he came up to me and went, you were right. You were right. And And it's lovely to hear, but the point of the conversation is if I'd have left Smarty in there, we'd have probably still done the same thing. Mm-hmm. And that was the beauty of this team. I, I, I felt like I could take anyone out of that squad and plug someone else in and they'd have still done a, 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 an amazing, uh, an amazing job. Um, so yeah, just, just immensely proud of them. Um, I never tell them because they'll get too big for their boots, but they're, 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 they're a good group. Uh, before we let you go, and we appreciate coming on here and telling us all about your season if there's one thing we could say is the secret of your success or one factor that's the most important to you having this amazing season is there anything you could pick out see i'd like i'd like to say honesty but i i i hope i mean that's probably not for me to say but i think the the culture of the change room has been derived mainly from honesty and that comes from not being in a position where the old adage of telling it like it is, which is usually an excuse for 
not very nice people to say as an excuse to say not very nice things and go well that's not my problem it's up to you to deal with it I think being honest with players being honest with those that you bring in even to in pre-season being honest with your values and on what you stand for and, and, and not kind of wavering on that um and I think the other thing is just lead like trying to lead with kindness rather than rockets and this idea that you have to be angry all the time. Um, I remember when I was at Hartley Whitney, there was a, a couple of people that told me I was too nice to manage and it stuck with me that, and I, I always believed it. And I think that's part of the, the imposter syndrome, which came in. Um, and I think now when you look at the managers coming up and you, you look at um, the, the Walton and Harsham managers, uh, ben over at Northwood. There's a lot of young managers in there, but we've all got one thing in common: is that we 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 try and treat players with respect, and 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 that's how I think the the the, the you get the best out of this this generation of footballers. I think that's that's how they just want to be treated like people, not as as products. Um, and I enjoy that side. I enjoy getting to know people and and understand them and and know that rather than giving a rollicking of why they're two minutes late for training and trying to work out why, because I might be able to help, you know, it's it's just that, like, I love that side of the game. So, I mean, it's no, it's no secret because I'm, I'm, it's not unique to me, but I, th- I think if, if I was to only draw back on, on one thing that um, I really enjoyed about this year was my, our ability as a management group to be honest with players and then be reciprocal to uh, us and also their teammates around them. It's been fascinating yeah. talking to you. Congratulations once again. Hope to speak to you again in future. Uh, Dan Brownley, manager of Bays in Stoke Town. Congratulations and thanks for being on the show today. Thanks so much. Cheers for having me. Uh, great time, Dan. And um, I'm spec- we all can't wait for the opening pictures to come out. See you soon. <laughs> Certainly well. Thank Dan you, Brownley, mate. the triple winning manager of Bays in Stoke Town. We're going to quickly go over to the newsroom now.